It's where you live, it's where you grow, it's where your dreams unfold. It's in every chapter of every story, it's more than just a home. Hey folks, welcome back to It's More Than Just a Home. I'm your host, Joy Robertson, and behind me is the Ozarks Lodge. Today, Rick Ramsey is excited to give us all a glimpse into the process of installing heating and cooling in this masterpiece of a home, and then take you behind the scenes of how we've incorporated smart home wiring into our builds. We'll also check in with our team working on the Habitat for Humanity home, and later dive into the new and exciting technology of repairing cement from the ground up. We've got a lot on our plate today, so let's dive right in. The technology in heating and cooling has advanced tremendously over the last 15 years. Energy efficiency is the key to new heating and cooling systems. So let's meet with Jeremy Grisham at SS&B to see what he did in this home. So Jeremy, today is reveal day. That's where the homeowners will actually see the furnishings installed in their home. Um, and it's just uh, turned out fabulous. I know they're excited to get moved in, but it would be a very uncomfortable day if the uh, heat didn't work. Yeah, it's pretty cold outside. That's today. right. So yeah. we put a state-of-the-art system in by train. And if you would, give us a little bit of the overview of the system we did install. So we've got a dual fuel, uh, variable speed heat pump installed in this house. The heat pump will keep up with the full demand of the house down to about 40 degrees. Then we have the gas back up for those more extreme days that the heat pump can't, can't keep up with the demand. Really nice attic. As you'll notice, we spray foam the roof decking and that uh, keeps this area acclimated. Right. It makes a big difference to an acclimated spaces like this where used to you'd have that hot and cold attic all the time. Right, yeah, it takes out the thermal heat gain and loss through the duct work um, and it uh, keeps, as you say, keeps the, the equipment in the conditioned space so we don't have it subject to those uh, extremes on humidity and temperature and things like that. We basically do what an engineer would do on a commercial building and we uh, take the uh, the insulation values, as you said, the direction that it faces mm -hmm. and the uh, performance of the windows and run a manual J calculation on it to size it. Um, and then once we have the system sized, we will do that same process room by room to break up the airflow to, so you don't end up with those hot and cold spots between rooms. This system actually controls the upstairs of this house and the master. Um, and there's a set of dampers. Uh, you can see one of them up there and yeah. you can set them to individual temperatures. It could be 75 up here and 70 in the master. And so it's kind of like two systems in one. Uh, this is a train XC95M. Uh, it's a modulating variable speed furnace. The modulating part of it, it means that it doesn't come on just full blast every time it comes on. Um, it can, it'll start off at 40% capacity and go up in 1% increments up to uh, from 40% to 100%. So, you know, on a 40 degree day like we have today, you don't need to run the furnace full blast like you would right. if it was zero outside. Right. Uh, the variable speed part of the uh, fan motor um, pretty much ensures the right amount of air always being pushed out of the system. It's a high efficiency model motor, so it draws less electricity. And there's lots of uh, bells and whistles you can add to these systems. You can do uh, dehumidification, humidification. We can run with our energy recovering ventilation systems, ERVs. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to help exchange that stale air with fresh air, being the home so tight. Tell us a little bit about some of those things you're seeing people want. Well, the ERV is something that is uh, a must for a uh, for a foam insulated house or something that's really tight construction like this one. Um, you can end up with humidity problems. It would be if you don't exchange that air, pull the stale air out, as you said, and bring fresh air back in. Right. Uh, kind of like if you put water in a cooler and close the lid, uh, you end up with a lot of those uh, condensation issues. Um, indoor air quality um, is a big factor in that also. Uh, you, all the carpets and the new furniture and stuff like that make off gas and if you don't get right. fresh air into the home and right. uh, stale air out then that affects your indoor air quality. Yeah and then the uh, the humidifiers those are good for uh, for the woodwork like we have in this home. Um, if you don't uh, keep the humidity controlled then you can have swelling and shrinking of the woods and things like that. Um, the comfort level um, is affected by the, uh, the humidity level also. In the right. wintertime, you need more humidity to feel warm. And then in the summertime, um, you want to remove that humidity because that also holds heat and your body feels that heat and it makes you feel more comfortable uh, with lower yeah. humidity there. 
There is not a moment in the day when the heating and cooling of a home doesn't affect the homeowner in some way. And I'm sure the people who live in this home appreciate the work that went into making it as energy efficient as possible. Let's take a quick break, and when we return, Rick will show us how he's incorporating smart home systems into new builds. Stick around, we'll be right back. But what we're gonna do is take this wire and feed it through the top plate. It's which more than going just a home. And welcome back. As I promised you before the break, Rick is ready to give you a glimpse into how the Ramsey Building Company has kept up with the 21st century by incorporating smart home systems and wiring into all of his new builds. Our partners at 3D Smart Homes have a lot to teach us today, and Rick may join them and get to work with an installation. So let's go catch up with them now. So Jason, we're actually here at one of my projects where we're actually pulling wire for smart homes. So what is it that is so important to get this wiring in before drywall? Well, when you've got a house of this size and trying to make it smart, you've got a lot of wires that go into it. It's different than just hanging a TV and hoping you've got some kind of connection. Oh, it, there's a lot of planning involved from the yeah. very, very beginning. We figure out the different locations where we want speakers, where we want televisions, where we need wireless routers and stuff like that for the internet. And then these guys come out and make sure it all happens. A lot of TVs, I know, just unless you put a sound bar, they virtually have no sound. So you're able to enhance that with surround sound speakers, correct? Absolutely. We add speakers to not only the other rooms of the house, but to every right. TV location to make it sound great. So with these boxes, let's actually look and see. These guys are pulling some wire here. Let's see how they do it. Yeah, they're started right now. So what they're doing is they've got all their wires labeled. And we pull them from the room back to the central location. Okay. And when we do that, they know exactly at the other end where that wire came from, what room it's in and what yeah. device it's connected to. So a central location, meaning it's in the house, not everything poking outside of the home. Exactly. Right. Just like we do with air conditioners. You could right. put one in every window in this place, or right. you could have one central unit. Right. So and what they're doing here is they're going to drill their pathways, 
And we've got to be careful as smart home providers, we've got to be careful to avoid plumbing and electrical and any of the other subcontractors. So we're usually a little further um, along when we get started. Exactly. We're uh, three days from insulating. So you're here at the very Perfect last. timing for us. Yeah. And you don't want any nicks or cuts in your way. No. We test everything as soon as we're done, but construction happens. And so we have seen some bad wires. We do try and run doubles and spares and extra locations that we won't be able to get to after the house is finished. Gotcha. The terminology smart home gets thrown around quite a bit in construction. Explain to us just a little bit what that actually means. So a smart home is a home that has some sort of brain in it, a processor that is watching what the home is doing. Similar to a computer processor. Exactly like that. In fact, the system we use is called Savant and it okay. runs on an Apple computer. Okay. All right. So you can run all types of things. You can run lighting, audio video. Can you turn on your coffee maker? If it has a remote or an okay. app, odds are pretty good that I can control it in a smart home. The okay. nice thing about a smart home is you have one device in charge of everything. Okay. So you have your garage doors, your door locks, your lights, your thermostat, pool, spa, gate, garage, whatever you want okay. is handled by a smart home. So looks like you might need some help. Is there anything I can do for you? I can get you up in the attic to pull these wires. Let's do it. So what we're doing, we're actually pulling the wire from the box we previously mentioned, making sure not to put it in any awkward kinks anything that could uh, pinch the wire and you want to feed it through the sub through the framing members itself and then we've got this hole drilled through the top plate of the wall and we'll actually fish this through this will become our volume control for the speakers that this wire will feed and we usually line those up pretty close to existing boxes such, such as light switches to run the the processor you can use your phone, you can use remotes. What, what types of things are out there? Absolutely, you can use any iPhone, any Android phone, anything okay. that's got a smartphone capability to it, as well as there are handheld remotes that come with the system if you just wanna sit on your couch and you know, channel surf as usual. Some people like the old fashioned remotes. We do about 50-50, okay. it's, it's kind of a blend. The way I look at it is you use your phone when you're controlling a general like sure. I want to turn the lights off in the entire house or when you're not home. If you want to be right. on vacation and change the thermostat, you should be able to do that. The remotes for when you're home and watching television. The systems themselves, the processors are usually good for about five years. Okay. And with the system that we use, they're upgradable via software. So we can usually get seven to eight years on hardware before we have to replace any of that. Okay. And that doesn't mean we have to replace the stuff that's already in the walls and around the house. That grows with the system. Yes, you're using capable wiring that will extend to the next generation of technology. Yes, we use universal wiring okay. so that I can be uh, brand agnostic. We can change from this to that. If a customer has Samsung and they love it and we want to put in a Sony television, we need to be able to work with both. The earlier we can get together with the homeowner, with the builder, right. and figure out what pieces are going to go in to enhance their lifestyle, the earlier we can plan, we can get our wires labeled, make sure everything's gonna work. We test everything before we install it, and this is the time to start. We do change often. In fact, our cycle runs about six months to nine months before yeah. products change. So we've gotta be on the cutting edge when it comes to wiring. And so we've gotta be a part of that. Smart homes are here to stay. Well, and we have kids to show us how to do it. That's true. <laughs> Grandkids are great tech support. Yeah. Whew, I tell you, these smart homes may be getting smarter than us. You know, I'm sure Rick's customers will love being able to control every aspect of their home and systems so easily. We're going to take a quick break now, and when we come back, Rick will have a very important meeting with Erica and our Habitat for Humanity family. So we'll see you back here in just a minute. It's more than just a home.
Welcome back. As everyone in the world knows, COVID-19 changed our lives forever. And as you would guess, Rick had to do Okay, so today's an exciting day. We're uh, here with Mills Foundations and Conco Companies to pour the footers, which will be the base of the foundation for the Wilmoth home. Okay, so, so the bottom floor is going to be about 1,800 square feet. Today we're pouring about 20 yards of concrete for the footers, which is what goes underneath the foundation wall, as well as the piers that will support the girders, which supports the house. Uh, the typical houses for Habitat for Humanity are two bedrooms around 800 square feet. We work our way up from there, uh, three bedroom, four bedrooms. We've done fives and sixes, but this is the largest house we've ever done. It's a seven bedroom home. It's going to be about 3,200 square feet. So far we're doing real good. We, we had a delayed start, uh, but once we got started, we're doing real good. We got excavated last Friday, and the foundation crew's here today pouring the footers. So we should have a foundation in within the next week or so. After the foundation, we'll, we'll have to seal the foundation from water, and then we'll put in a drainage system inside the foundation in case water were to ever get in, we'll be able to pump it out and then we will start framing. What you see with these square forms, that is the outline of the house. The foundation walls will sit on those footers. And then you see the circles in the middle, those are where the piers are going to be that support the, the main beams that support the floor of the home. I hope that you are as excited as I am to witness such an awesome and meaningful project as this one. They really are a beautiful family and their story is so heartwarming. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we will head out to a client's home to speak with the team from Raising Solutions and watch them work their magic to raise a concrete driveway years after it's been constructed. So stick around. We'll be right back. It's more than just a home.
So I know you got lots of color. You got everything from knockout roses. Well, we've all seen it. Concrete that cracks, settles, and sometimes even separates. It could be a driveway, it could be sidewalk, front and back porch, basement floor, and in some cases, our precious foundations on our homes. It can be unsightly. It can be even disturbing for a lot of homeowners dealing with this. Well, today, we're gonna to show you how this can be dealt with and a solution. Today, we're gonna to meet Brian Baker with Raising Solutions, and we're gonna show you how he's able to take concrete and help repair, assist, and in some cases, totally heal the situation. Follow me. Hey, Brian. Morning, Rick. How are, How are you? you? I'm good, good. you? Good, good. What we got going on here? Well, today we're being uh, leveling up this driveway, and we have a void underneath here that we're gonna be uh, filling as well. What we do, it's really separated. It has, it has. So and it's just become a trip hazard for the customer getting in and out of the car. Yeah, right? and it looks like you've up. already drilled. We've got a sidewalk issue as well. We have a sidewalk issue over there with a settlement, a trip hazard, That's and a void. That's definitely a trip hazard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Especially coming out when it's not much daylight. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay. You want to pitch in? Sure. Get All me, right. Get me started. Yep. Yeah. We're going to do a whole about right All here right. and then one in between there. Okay. What about right there, Rick? I'll do it. I normally charge for this kind of stuff, but today it's free. Today's free? Yeah. Sound like you're using foam. We're gonna use a four pound polyurethane okay. foam. Okay, close, close cell foam. Close cell so. foam. And we're gonna, it goes in as a liquid. And as, as it spreads, it fills the gap underneath there. Once it has no other place to go, okay. we're going to get hydraulic pressure and it'll lift that concrete level back up. So is this a similar product to uh, what we use for insulation in our homes? It is. It's okay. exactly the same. Okay. It just reacts slower okay. than the uh, insulation foam. So the material, when it goes in, in about 20 seconds, it's done, going to grow. It's growing as far as it's going to grow. Okay. 30 minutes after we're done, from the last port okay. that's as hard as that material is ever going to get. So okay. you can use it immediately. There's no downtime, no disruption to your yard, your landscaping, anything. Well, for years people deal with this, or if they don't want to deal with it, it's very expensive. They have to cut it and replace it. Correct. So this is much more effective. In fact, the homeowners, they're not even here. They're going to come back today and it's all done. Correct. Right. You do quite a bit of foundation work too, correct? We do foundation stabilization. Okay. We do soil stabilization. Okay. If you got an area that uh, you know doesn't meet the specs on the soil, we can inject down in to strengthen it up. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we try to use clean rock underneath Correct. our uh, on our new builds, but occasionally the soil underneath the rock just isn't stable Correct. enough. That's right. So, yeah. yeah, you get a plastic soil or uh, right. something like that. Just it's better not to dig it all out. You can yep. do the foam to strengthen it up. Okay. Is it a two-part mix? It is a two-part mix, one-to-one. -one. Okay. Yeah, the right. B, the foam part of it, is uh, all recycled foam. Recycled foam. Yep, it's all green. Huh. Come here, I want to show you something real quick. This is by far the largest void we have on this project. It's so big, I can actually stick my fist in underneath it, which would allow animals even to enter underneath this concrete. So it's going to be really unique to see how this sidewalk is solidified with this foam injection. Uh, looks like our sidewalk is starting to lift over here. Brian has already injected the driveway and so it's on its way up and now the sidewalk's starting to catch with the driveway. Then we'll move over and figure out how to fix this void. Is it moving up? Yes sir. So I think we're getting ready to have a volcanic explosion with our foam. Which is what we're after. You can see some rocks moving now. Yes I do. Right there. So you'll shut down the foam and let it kind of expand and see what yep. happens here. Yeah, the only enemy we have, the foam has, is UV light from the sun. Breaks it down. Breaks it down over time. Yep. So you can see the foam found the least path of resistance, and that's the joint between the sidewalk and the driveway. It's a very hard product, 
and uh, it's super lightweight but very dense at the same time. And this is what's going to actually fill the void underneath the concrete and give us the lift that we're after. Thank you so much for coming along with us today. We've covered a lot of ground, and as you can tell, Rick is so thankful to be working with all of these dedicated and talented vendors. I'll see you all again next week when we head back to the Ozarks Lodge to install some hardware in the home, take a look at the flooring, and wrap up this home before we take a sneak peek at our next home project. Until then, I want to thank you for taking this journey with us. Now, if you want to see these segments again and learn more about the Ozarks Lodge, go to RamseyBuilding.com. And until then, let's get building.